about to head into Alto Hospicio. This small municipality sits on the edge of the Atacama Desert and is one of Chile's most dangerous areas. And when we were in Santiago speaking with some Chileans, they thought we were insane for coming here. Why are you going there? Someone gets shot there every week. But the reason why we're here is to uncover the truth of the linear economy. What is happening when we throw things away? The truth is, the products that we don't want anymore just get moved to a different place. One of these places is the driest desert on Earth, the Atacama Desert. That pair of ASICs we grew out of, that handbag which grew out of fashion, that pair of Nike sneakers we didn't want anymore, aren't gone or dealt with. They're just sitting here in Chile. We don't want any of this stuff. So how can we fill the world with things that we want, rather than choke the world with things that we don't want anymore? Let's find out. We currently have a linear economy. We take materials, we make products out of them, we use them, and then we throw them away. But as we've seen in Alto Hospicio, that doesn't deal with it. Throwing it away just means dumping it somewhere else. Throwing stuff away is a bad choice environmentally, but it's an even worse choice economically. We are not only damaging ecosystems, we are filling up valuable land space by hoarding products that we don't want anymore. When we throw a product away, we are throwing away the materials that we need to make new products out of circulation, only to have to reproduce them. So to fill the world with things that we want, rather than choke the world with the things that we don't want anymore, we need to stop creating waste by designing products that can be easily broken back down into their raw materials from which we can make new products, and eliminate existing waste by bringing the materials from thrown away products back into circulation. This is the circular economy, the way nature does it. All the materials are kept in circulation by designing out waste. Used products are broken down into their raw materials, which can go into making new products. In this documentary, we are going to learn how to eliminate waste and build a circular economy using good design and insights from behavioral psychology and neuroscience. First, we will meet the indigenous people of the Andes, learning from their circular lifestyles how to live more in harmony with nature, as well as about the challenges they are facing living on the fault line between our current linear economy and nature's circular economy. Then we will hear from academics and experts about how we can make our economy circular again, and finally, we will see what the pioneers are already doing to make our economy circular, and how we can join them, whatever position we're in. First, let's go to South America to see what we can learn from the indigenous people of the Andes mountain range about circularity and living in harmony with nature. Our first destination, the highest capital city in the world. As soon as we arrived, we were greeted by a carnival, literally blocking the road to the airport. I had no idea why, but I had to get involved. That evening we met Elena, one of the Chilitas Escaladores, who explained this tradition to us. Andean culture fosters a respect and gratitude towards nature. These carnivals are a tradition to remind Andeans to celebrate the symbiotic relationship we have with nature. 
to care for their environment and to give thanks for nature's provision. Elena invited us to come to a proper rural Bolivian carnival in her husband's hometown the next day. Curious, we took a 400 kilometer detour to her husband's village to see what we could learn about the culture and how they view their relationship with nature. There was a lot of drinking, so for someone who doesn't drink alcohol, this was intense. As they forced shots of their 90% alcohol into my hand, I did my best Mr Bean impression to avoid corroding my throat. However, I noticed they were doing something weird, aside from getting heroically drunk. They kept pouring some of their alcohol on the ground when they opened a new bottle. It turns out, this is another tradition to show gratitude for nature. They give the first and therefore the best portion of their alcohol back to nature by pouring it on the ground as an offering of thanks. Throughout our expedition, I noticed that this wasn't just a carnival behaviour. People did this even in restaurants as a daily reminder that we are in a working relationship with nature and a part of its circular economy. So to increase the flourishing of each other, we need to give good back to nature rather than just throwing our waste at it. Then we will have a symbiotic relationship of increasing prosperity rather than destruction and hardship. However, because we have neglected this relationship, the Andeans are now living on the fault line where our linear economy clashes with nature's circular economy. We have recently heard news about climate justice because the communities that haven't really participated in industrialization are the ones facing most of the consequences. The reason why indigenous communities are worse affected by climate instabilities is because they have less buffers financially and environmentally. The community surrounding Lake Popo relies on the lake for fishing. However, in recent years, the lake has dried up, causing the surrounding villages to lose their source of food and income. Siempre he vivido aquí casi ya yo tengo 60 años. Es sumamente importante este lago. Ahí antes pescábamos aquí, había pescado cualquier cantidad y cada cual se comíamos asado cada día, pero sin embargo se ha secado ya durante casi 30 años y no no ya no hay pescado. Entonces este recursos naturales nos nos ayudaba en gran manera porque vendíamos pescado, oruro, nosotros mismos comíamos, entonces ya nos ayudaba en mucha manera en este, este lago. Cuando hubo recién quinoa también ahora sembramos de eso hemos regresado entonces porque en este muchas cosas hacíamos había pasto aquí cualquier cantidad de pasto pero se ha secado entonces esa así era en este lago. It is clear to Andeans that they have to value everything that they have and to tend to their environment for it to provide for them. They learned this lesson from the history of overworking the land that is thought to have led to the droughts and subsequent demise of great ancient civilizations in the region, such as the Tiwanaku Empire. We must make our economy circular to avoid such hardship and destruction, and to move towards the prosperity and flourishing that a symbiotic relationship with nature produces. First, we learnt about how Andean culture fosters a gratitude and appreciation for the working relationship we have with nature. We learnt from their greater awareness that we and everything we make and produce are a part of nature's circular economy. And we have seen that indigenous communities are the worst affected by our linear economy conflicting with nature's circular economy. This brings us back to the landfills of Alto Hospicio, the most obvious clash between linearity and circularity. Every second we throw away one garbage truck full of textiles. Imagine every second three people throwing out all the textiles they own. A lot of this is barely worn before it is just dumped and left to sit in landfills like this one in the Atacama Desert. On average, we wear a garment seven times. Only seven times. Imagine you buy a new garment, you wear it each day next week, then you never wear it again. That's effectively what's happening. If you're ultimately only going to wear it a few times, there are three reasons why you shouldn't buy it. Two for personal benefit 
and one for environmental benefit. Seven uses probably doesn't justify the price. If you don't really, really want it, it will soon just take up space in your wardrobe and habitually consuming clothes you don't really need or want has a big impact on the environment. Most people know about the environmental impact of shipping and aviation. There are a lot of people really putting an effort in not flying as much, for example. However, because we produce and throw away such unnecessary amounts of textiles, 10% of global carbon emissions come from the fashion industry. That is more than aviation and shipping combined. One of the big impactors is jeans. One pair of Levi's Classic 501 jeans consumes around 7,000 litres of water. That's as much water as you will consume in the next decade. If we estimate that Levi's produces 50 million pairs of 501 jeans in Lesotho each year, that's enough water to sustain over a third of Africa or the whole of South America. The amount of water Levi's uses for their 501 line of jeans alone, which constitutes less than 1% of global jean production, is enough water to sustain a quarter of the 2 billion people across the world currently living without clean water. Now, I'm not saying that Levi's is starving half a billion people of water. Obviously, the infrastructure would be needed to treat and divert the water to the people in need. But ultimately, we can see from the huge impact that producing jeans has on the environment that we need to reduce our use of virgin materials. Circulation of existing textiles is clearly the solution. Initially, it sounds like a loss, but buying less new clothes is actually something that we want to do. As we've already established, we don't actually need this many clothes, we don't want to waste money, and we don't want to wear clothes that we don't really like or feel good in. By designing products to be broken down and using their materials to make new products, as well as collecting products that have already been thrown away and bringing their materials back into circulation, we will eliminate the concept of waste and stop the issue of landfills like we have seen in the Atacama Desert. We met a company doing something about this situation called Ecositex. Ecositex collects the waste from Alto Hospicio, as well as intercepting unwanted textiles from the local community. Then they break these textiles down into raw materials from which people can make new products. They chop and grind the collected textiles into a wool, which they then make into a yarn. The finished products are beautiful coloured yarns that can be knit and woven together to make new products. Ultimately, our journey through South America clearly shows the clash between the linear economy we have built through industrialization and the circular economy of nature, which we and everything we make and use are a part of. Although a lot of work needs to be done to design circular products and systems to stop the creation of waste, I left the Andes with hope knowing that people are already doing something about eliminating the existing waste. Back in London, I wanted to find out why we still have a linear economy and how we can make our economy circular again. So I spoke with the experts to learn why we are currently predisposed towards linearity and how we can predispose ourselves and our economy towards circularity. Here's what I learned in a nutshell. In order to make our economy circular again, we need to stop creating waste by designing our products and systems to keep the raw materials in circulation and eliminate existing waste by bringing thrown away products back into the circulation of materials. The linear economy and the very concept of waste is a human invention. We have lost sight of the fact that we live in and are a part of nature's circular economy. In nature, there really is no such thing as waste. Everything is broken down, is translated, is transformed, metabolised into something else in an, in an endless cycle, but they never become redundant. Neither should they in our economy. Waste is when we render materials worthless. Circularity is when we always see materials as valuable. So if circulation is the natural order of reality, then why are we trying to sustain a line? Besides environmentally, linearity doesn't even make sense economically. Throwing things away takes up valuable land space by hoarding products that we don't want anymore. But more importantly, we are making the planet a worse place to live by polluting and damaging ecosystems with these products that we don't even want anymore, when we could be increasing their health and diversity 
which symbiotically would make the planet a healthier, more flourishing place to live, and materialistically increase our yield of organic materials. And finally, it takes materials that we need out of circulation, meaning that we incur the cost of having to extract or synthesize more of these materials. We've created a system that generates waste, and that's really a failure of design. And we fail to plan how our products will be reincorporated into the circulation of materials, it leads to this crazy position where we are filling the world with products that we don't want, rather than using their materials to build new products that we do want. But we aren't stuck in this position. We can design our way out of it. The transition from linear economy to circular economy requires us to stop creating waste and eliminate existing waste. So how do we do this? Reduction is the kind of highest priority, like get rid of the need for that thing in the first place. For the products that we do actually need, we can design out waste and keep the raw materials in circulation by making products out of use appropriate materials that can be efficiently broken down and then made into new products. We need to start considering circular designs as a circular systems design not just product design. But the other really important thing is that businesses need to create clear communication. To put on products what they are made from and exactly what to do with them when we don't want them anymore. This will all help stop the creation of waste. We can also eliminate existing waste by creating the infrastructure to collect old products that we have thrown away, disassemble them and recirculate the raw materials like EcoCTEX are doing cleaning up the mess in Alto Hospicio. We can see this challenge opportunistically. The existing waste is actually a resource ripe for harvest. It's free material. It doesn't make sense to throw materials that we need away, but by keeping the materials we have already extracted or synthesized in circulation, we will reap the significant economic benefits of needing less virgin material. Take textiles, for instance. Today, it is estimated that only 1% of textile products are recycled back into textile production. This is absurd because our demand for textiles is still growing, so we still need that other 99%. We are only going to have to reproduce the materials that we throw away, so it would be a lot cheaper and environmentally beneficial to keep them in circulation. Six years ago, cotton was farmed in India to produce this t-shirt. I love this t-shirt, but when it starts to get holes in it and when it gets worn out, in the linear economy, I throw it away. Well, we know that this doesn't deal with it. It will just get dumped somewhere else, like the Atacama Desert. In the circular economy, we could send this t-shirt back to the producer for them to break it down into raw materials and use those to make new products. For example, this green t-shirt could easily be turned into a green yarn which can then be used to make new green products. We can make products that are, from the very beginning, able to be disassembled as needed. Breaking down products into raw materials and using them to make new products is the circular solution to our waste problem. However, there is a fear that if we keep circulating the same materials, we will be stuck with less quality, old technology and limited development. But this is not the case. Everything is a recomposition of more fundamental building blocks that have been combined and broken down for millennia. At a fundamental level, the raw materials don't change, but using our innovation and technology, we can change what we transform them into. Currently, we have to re-extract or resynthesize the same materials to materialize new technology. But we can just use the materials that we already have. If the material is dirty or damaged, we can break it down to a raw form from which we can reconstruct new material and then build new products. Clearly circularity is the solution. So how can we change our economy from linear to circular? There are already a lot of people out there who want to change, but they don't know how to make that change. One of the effects that the current dominant narratives of climate change have, cold red for humanity, highway to climate hell, doom narrative, is that it can paralyze people. But the narratives of doing can lead to action. If climate change were food, our level of sophistication in how we talk about it would be to say, if you don't eat, you're gonna die. 
We don't communicate about food in that way. Instead of that, we are giving people recipes. We are teaching them how to cook healthy and good food. And the thing that is needed instead of raising concern in order to try and get people to act is to give them the recipes for acting. This is what behavioral psychology provides. It can explain our current predicament and show us how we can put circular solutions into practice, whatever position we're in. Once we understand how we make decisions, we can engineer our decision environment so that we can make better decisions by default, rather than having to think really hard about them. So then why do we have a linear economy in the first place? Fortunately, psychology can explain that too. One of the real insights that is coming out of neuroscience and psychology research these days is that our brains aren't doing one type of thinking, but at least two different types of thinking. On the one hand, you have intuitive, automatic responding to the environment. On the other hand, you have the more deliberative, where you've got the little voice in your head making a case for why you should be doing a certain thing. Those two types of thinking are constantly interacting in all of us, in all of the decisions that we are making. The intuitive, automatic parts of our brain is like a giant elephant, and reasoning, that little voice in our head, is like a rider that sits on top of the elephant. Now, classically, the rider is in control, but what the science is telling us is actually that the elephant is calling the shots most of the time. The reason why our elephant is in control is simply because they were there as mechanisms to help us survive. Our elephant evolved to automate our actions and find defaults to carry us safely through our day to day using minimal resources so that we don't have to waste our time, energy and effort thinking on surviving but we can spend them on developing, climbing the hierarchy of needs, and beginning to thrive. This evolutionary adaptation of conserving resources is why we are naturally predisposed towards convenience. In this modern day environment, we now have less of that need to survive. And that means that those mechanisms of the elephant that are just responding to the environment are now driven more towards those unsustainable choices simply because of the way that we've created an environment of convenience where the convenient choices are the ones that are not sustainable, that are not circular. If the convenience options are linear and we have evolved to be predisposed towards convenience, is there any hope for making our economy circular again? Well, this is a misconception that our psychology is stacked against us. We are at this moment in a, a, a tight interaction between our psychology and our environment, where the linear choices are the ones we make by default. But that doesn't mean we can't change that. The misconception is to confuse the way our brain works generally with the way it works specifically in our current environment. Our predisposition towards convenience is not a predisposition towards linearity. Depending on how our environment is structured, in terms of what the most convenient options are, we could be predisposed towards linearity or towards circularity. If the most convenient options that we continue to give our elephant are linear, it will continue to automatically choose linearity. What we can do is restructure our environment such that the better choices become the default choices, that we automatically end up doing the things that are better for the environment. Here is an example of how we can restructure our environment from one of the founders of behavioral economics. Take the example of the cafeteria downstairs. Somebody had to decide where to put the salad bar, where to put the burgers, where to put the ice cream, where to put the coffee. That person is a choice architect because the arrangement of the food influences the choices that we make. So for example, in our cafeteria, you have to go buy the salad bar to get to the burgers. That increases the chance that you're gonna go for the salad, which is a good thing. The choice architect has the power to make the convenient options either linear or circular in their environment of influence. We can engineer our decision environment so that we can make better decisions by default, rather than having to think really hard about them. We are the choice architect of our personal environment, and so can restructure it to improve our personal actions. For example, predisposing ourselves to exercise by laying our running clothes out before going to bed so that they are in our way in the morning. But we must also realize that in companies, industry, and government, 
we are the choice architect of others. To fulfill our responsibility to steward those we influence well, we must consult them on what they want us to make the most convenient options. Then we will predispose ourselves, our society and our economy towards the choices that we want to make. Ultimately, we are not permanently biased towards linearity or powerless to change. And despite what much of the current messaging might suggest, we do not act in linear ways because we are bad people. We are just naturally responding to a negatively primed environment. Now that we understand that this is how we make decisions, it's clear that we must restructure our choice environment to move away from linearity and towards circularity. So who actually makes the decisions? Who has the power to change things? What is really happening at the moment is that everyone is pointing the finger at everyone else. Everyone is thinking that the first steps need to be taken by consumers or uh, the businesses or the politicians regulating the businesses. Everyone's pointing at everyone else and waiting for things to happen. And then as a result, nothing is happening. We've been passing the bucket of the guilt further down the line, and it stops where? With the consumer. But those studying behavior change are telling us it is the systems that need to change in order to improve the vast majority of our individual actions. The behavioral economists Lowenstein and Chater recently published a paper saying, We spend all of our time in the last 10, 15 years focusing on individual behavior change on tweaking something such that an individual would make a slightly different choice. What we now are convinced of is that we should have been focusing on the systems change. Others also came to this realization that we need to change the systems in which we make our choices. For example, at UCL, the behavioral insights team who for a long time have been focusing on these little nudges, wrote a paper about behavior change for net zero and said actually, most of the interventions that need to happen should be what they call midstream or upstream interventions. So they have this analogy of a stream. And if you are focusing on individual behavior change, then it's if you're shouting at someone from the side of the river, swim harder against the current. If we take a step back, the situation we're in seems crazy. We need to move towards circularity, but we have created a strong current towards linearity that is flowing against us. And instead of focusing on changing the flow, we are telling people to swim harder against the flow. But as we have established, we have evolved to conserve resources. If we work hard, then we can stay in the same place or maybe inch forward towards circularity. But this seems a waste of energy and a meaningless sacrifice, especially when our individual effort is greatly outweighed by the flow taking the vast majority of people away from our goal you need to change the flow of the river such that people are swimming with the flow rather than against the flow if they want to make these better choices. Again, the fashion industry is a clear example of what is going wrong. We capitalize on people's needs, creating a current towards overconsumption. Then when we realize this is a bad idea, we put the responsibility on the consumer and shout at them from the side to swim harder rather than using our power as the choice architect of their environment to change the flow. It's time for government and industry to step up and start providing these solutions. We need to focus on consumers' well-being in relationship to clothes. We need to ask what functions do clothes fundamentally serve for individuals. For example, frequent runners will wear out a pair of shoes in about six months. For this not to become a waste problem, we need to redesign how we meet that need in a circular way. We will hear about some businesses that are doing this in a moment. Ultimately, we have created an environment where the flow pushes people towards linear behaviors. But the good news is we can restructure our environment and change the flow towards circularity. Rather than trying to preach harder at people that they need to change their behaviors. Once the flow has changed, even when we are not trying, we will still be moving forward with the flow. And when people start swimming with the flow, rather than wasting energy, their energy will combine with the flow for greater impact. Right, so how do we change the flow? The thing is that there isn't one player who has the power to make the change happen. It is an interconnected system. That will require production, industry, government policy and consumers working together as a system. 
Now we know that there is a trickle down effect of behavioral influence. Government influences how businesses act, who influence how consumers act. So the focus needs to be on government and businesses changing the flow rather than on the individuals swimming harder against the flow. You can let go of the weight of eco-anxiety and powerlessness. We don't have to feel responsible to work unreasonably hard against the flow, whilst knowing deep down that if we change, but the flow doesn't change, we aren't really going to get anywhere. However, the focus being on governments and businesses restructuring our environment doesn't mean that we don't have any responsibility as individuals. If we don't play our part in minimizing our waste and using the circular products and systems that governments and businesses provide, the circular economy will fail. So let's take a closer look at how each player can fulfill their responsibilities. As individuals, our primary responsibility is to swim in the right direction, to minimize the waste we produce by choosing the circular options and using the circular infrastructure where available. To secure the changing of the flow, we must confirm to government and businesses that we want them to provide and predispose us towards circularity. By choosing the circular options when the other options are equally or even more convenient. As the flow is in transition, this will require us to put in a little extra effort. But this is when our role is particularly important. Businesses have a dual role. To help us stop creating waste by producing circular products and providing systems that keep their materials in circulation and to eliminate existing waste by collecting thrown away products and bringing them back into the circulation of materials. Governments are the choice architect of both businesses and individuals. They can fulfill their role as stewards towards social and economic prosperity by using policy to restructure our environment towards circularity so that the circular options are put first and made the most convenient. They can use policy to change the system such that the right behavior becomes the easy behavior. This is important because there is a big difference between what people say they want and what they do. This say-do gap or value-action gap as it's called in different branches of psychology, we've known about that since the 1930s and the reason for that is often that most of our behaviors don't come out of conscious attitudes in our heads, they come out of mindless interactions with the environment. Even though people want to do the right thing, the infrastructure and system isn't there to support. At this very moment, it's much easier to get around in a petrol car still than it is to get around in an electric car because the infrastructure isn't sort of at a level playing field. At all. So by restructuring the environment, governments can predispose citizens towards doing the behaviors that they want to do. Aside from restructuring the choice environment, governments need to ensure transparency to fix the problem of trust and make sure that everyone knows how to keep the materials that we have in circulation. Right now, most consumers have heard a lot about sustainability, but also a lot about greenwashing. Governments can fix this by regulating labeling so that businesses have to put on products what they are made from and exactly what to do with them when we don't want them anymore. So if we get that right, it means that every one of us can play a really useful part in that circular system. To keep the planet healthy, we have ambitious targets like reducing emissions by 43% before 2030 to keep within 1.5 degrees of planetary warming. However, fighting harder against the flow of a negatively primed environment to continue inching forwards is a myopic linear mentality that will lead to failure. Restructuring our environment so that the flow will push us towards our goal will be much faster and more successful. Once the flow has changed towards circularity, swimming towards circular options will become easier and we will be able to develop faster and achieve more. Then we'll be able to work on optimizing our circular infrastructure to reduce the energy that it requires and the emissions that it produces to meet our target by the deadline of 2030. Ultimately, to make our economy circular again, we need to restructure our choice environment to predispose ourselves towards circularity. And we might feel concerned about governments or big businesses influencing our behavior like this. It feels a little like big brother authoritarianism, like we are giving them too much power. However, in this documentary, we have discovered that they already have this power. As the choice architects of our environment, they are currently influencing our decision-making. 
Our environment is already designed in a certain way. We've already created a choice environment by all of the policies and decisions that we've made in the past. So we're not suggesting that we should give governments and businesses new power. We're proposing that they use their existing influence in a more constructive way. Currently, the linear options have been made the most convenient. We are proposing that they restructure our environment so that the circular options are made the most convenient. Remember, restructuring our choice environment will not reduce our freedom of choice. It will just make it easier to choose circular options over linear options. Now that we've clarified that restructuring towards circularity is not some power grab arising from tyrannical motives, but rather a more constructive use of existing influence, we need to consider why do government and businesses have this influence in the first place, and then is restructuring towards circularity something that we want? So why do we give governments such power over our environment and influence over us? If it is to steward the population towards greater social and economic prosperity, then structuring towards linearity is a failure of stewardship, because that leads to destruction and hardship. So for the purpose of fulfilling their societal role alone, restructuring towards circularity is necessary. But then do we actually want to be predisposed towards circularity? Let's look at a case study from Singapore. While I was living in Singapore, the government created a scheme to help improve national fitness and counter diabetes, where citizens could earn money for meeting exercise goals. Now would we consider this restructuring of the choice environment to predispose citizens towards healthy habits a bad thing, or a tyrannical stunt to increase the government's power and authority? No, citizens are not forced to exercise, the government is just providing an incentive which makes it easier to create a habit of exercise, something that citizens probably want to do anyway. This is an example of good stewardship. I think most people would say that they would like to be predisposed towards healthy habits. So the government used policy to reflect this desire by restructuring the choice environment towards exercise. And I believe we have an even stronger collective desire for circularity than we do for exercise. Even the minority of oil execs or fuel guzzling, diesel pickup driving anti-environmentalists we might imagine are proponents of linearity don't actually want to destroy the planet. Their environmentally damaging behaviours are just a means to fulfil their needs. For the oil exec, this could be to please stakeholders. For the diesel driver, this could be to fulfil their need to have ruggedness, reliability and power across all terrains. Like us, they just want to thrive and keep satisfying their needs. So if oil production does need to be minimised and fossil fuel powered cars do need to be phased out in order to make our economy circular and stay within planetary limits, how can we ensure that their needs are still being met? So instead of attacking them for having these needs, we can just study and then redesign how we fulfill these needs instead of asking people to suppress their needs. If we are able to fulfill their needs in a circular way, for example by designing an EV with equal performance, they will not deliberately continue to choose the linear option. Ultimately, we do want to be predisposed towards circularity, because inching forwards against the flow comes at serious cost to our freedom and our development. Take flying for example. Many people say that we should stop flying because it produces a lot of emissions. To reduce emissions we could stop production, however this is a linear mentality of swimming harder against the existing flow rather than changing it. The circular mentality is about transforming production so that everything that is produced is kept in circulation, not emitted. In this case, we could work to electrify air travel using circular energy sources rather than fossil fuels which are hard to keep in circulation. The circular economy is not about reducing freedoms or restricting technologies like eliminating air travel. It's about developing these good technologies to minimise the emissions they produce and then the energy that they require. Now that we understand we must restructure our choice environment towards circularity in order to change our behaviours, and that being predisposed towards circularity is something that we want, what is being done to stop the creation of waste and bring the materials from existing waste back into circulation? Not a lot of people have done this and taken this step, but there are some really exciting pioneers out there that are taking this chance to learn through doing and sharing it with other companies, um, with other academics, with the public. And those stories of action 
can then inspire other people to act as well. So the biggest source of learning that we can have is learning from the actions of other people. Social psychologists call that social learning. If one person learns from the next and then from the next and the next and so on, you get this exponential rise of people who know how to bring climate action into their personal, professional, civic lives. This is starting to happen across industries. But given what we have seen in Alto Hospicio, let's focus on the fashion industry. I spoke with some of the pioneers of circularity in fashion to learn what they are doing to make our economy circular and how we can join them. On is a sportswear company that was started by three Swiss friends in 2010 and has since rapidly grown to become one of the biggest sports brands and is represented by some of the world's best athletes like Roger Federer. I was invited to the launch of their flagship store in London to meet the team and speak with them about what they are doing to stop the creation of waste by designing circular products and systems and bring the materials from existing waste back into circulation. So our goal at all is to have a future where we have petrol-free products that are coming back in circularity. We realized it's fantastic to do shoes out of recycled products, but what happens if they don't come back to you? They end up in a landfill. So our idea was we launched the first subscription shoes in the industry that you have to send back to get a new one. So that's cycle and it's our drive towards circularity. Continuing with firsts, Clean Cloud is the first ever shoe made from carbon emissions. On's partner Lanzatech captures carbon emissions ethylates them, turning it into an alcohol, from which they can make an EVA foam, which forms the sole of the shoe. This product takes existing waste and brings it back into the circulation of materials. Another company pioneering circularity in fashion is Adidas. They are also helping us to stop creating waste and eliminate the existing waste. They have launched a made to be remade line where when you no longer want a product or have worn it out, you send it back to Adidas and they break it down into its raw materials, which they circulate into new products. And in collaboration with Parley, Adidas are collecting plastics that have been thrown away and found their way into the ocean and transforming them into yarns that they can then make clothes and shoes from. Imagine our economy is a pool. The water it is filled with represents the materials we have extracted or synthesized. However, there is a leak in the pool. We are wasting materials. To keep the pool full, we could just keep pumping water into it until we run out, but we know that the real solution is to first stop the leak and keep the materials circulating, and second, clean up the mess and filter what we can collect back into circulation. On and Adidas are both doing great work to address these requirements. They are stopping the creation of waste by creating circular products, systems and business models. And they are starting to eliminate the existing waste by reincorporating thrown away products back into the circulation of materials. But transforming waste into new products isn't enough. We need to create circulation infrastructure for all of these products too, otherwise they will also become waste and we will never stop the leak, but we'll just have to keep cleaning up the mess. Making compostable products is not a good solution either, because it perpetuates a linear mentality and often doesn't work. We've designed quite a lot of these products without thinking about the systems that they go into. So by making compostable products, we are effectively greenwashing. We are reinforcing the throwaway mindset of thinking, ah, nature will just take care of it, rather than taking the responsibility to keep our materials in circulation. If we still want these materials, it doesn't make sense to just throw them away. And if we don't want them anymore, well then they need to be broken down into a raw form to be reabsorbed by Earth. But despite what the name suggests, compostable products often can't be reabsorbed by Earth. Part of the research here at UCL and the Plastic Waste Innovation Hub are things like compostable plastics. They conducted a study in the UK which found that 60% of plastics labelled home compostable were not. The problem with compostable packaging is the labelling 
on that packaging isn't regulated currently. We would expect compostable packaging to disintegrate within a few weeks or maybe months, but in reality, they were often intact over two years later. There is a lack of regulation around the labelling and the communication of those materials. And that's hugely problematic, because what it means is that these materials might be misidentified and then put into the incorrect disposal systems. So if they go into things like recycling systems, they cause contamination. If they go in your general waste, well, they're never going to compost because when you put something in general waste, it's either going to a landfill site or an incinerator. So we need to avoid making compostable products and governments need to regulate labelling so that all materials can be kept in circulation. And for the waste that we transform into new products, we need to ensure that we build circulation infrastructure so that these products don't become waste themselves. Ultimately, it's clear that the linear economy doesn't make economic or environmental sense, and that in order to develop, we need to restructure towards circularity. So what can we do today to fulfill our responsibilities? We've seen some producers are already offering integrated circular products and systems, but lots more big brands and high street stores are now offering recycling services. One of the big names offering a recycling service is Apple. In most countries, Apple offers a free trade-in or recycling scheme for any old tech devices you have. It doesn't have to be an Apple product or even a type of product that Apple makes. For example, I've got two old MacBooks here from back when they had CD drives. Then there's a Kindle and even a printer, neither of which are products that Apple make, but they will recycle them anyway. All you've got to do is take it to your nearest Apple store and tell them it's for recycling. Done, recycled. For newer products, you may even get trading credit, which you can put towards buying a new product. Apple are doing this because they have realized that yes, we need to stop creating waste, but it is actually in their economic interest to create circular infrastructure and a circular business model because the materials from old products are the same materials used to make new products. If they don't have to extract as much virgin materials, especially rare earth metals, they can significantly reduce costs and therefore increase profits. Why throw them away and supply ourselves with the difficulty of extracting new rare earth metals and dwindling our reserves if we can supply ourselves with old products from which we can extract the same rare earth metals easily, cheaply and without dwindling our reserves? As businesses building recycling infrastructure and offering services to recycle their old products becomes more and more the norm, people will actually start competing and bidding for what used to be considered waste, as they come to the realisation that old products are a valuable resource. That's actually already happening. For example, I have this pair of old beat up shoes that I can't really wear anymore, but their materials are still valuable. Given the rise in recycling infrastructure, not only can you recycle your shoes for free, with a little bit of research, you can actually pick a reward for doing so. If they are in good condition, you can give them to charity to bless someone else. If they aren't in reusable condition, companies like Jogon or Soex, or in some countries even Nike, will recycle them for free. Finally, some places may even give you a voucher, like Runners Need who offered £20 for recycling your trainers. If you're in the UK, MS provides a unified solution to textile recycling called Schwapping. You can drop any item from any brand into a Schwap box at any MS clothing store, whether it's old, worn out socks, hats, scarves, any item. They even take bed linen and accessories. Once you drop it in, they'll assess it. If it's in good condition, it will be sold by their partner charity Oxfam to help fund their work. And if it's not in a resellable condition, MS will recycle it, breaking it down into its raw materials to be made into new products. We currently have a linear economy. We take materials, we make products, and then we throw them away. But as we've seen in Alto Hospicio, that just means dumping it somewhere else. We need to transition to a circular economy, where all the materials we use are kept in circulation where we design out waste so that used products are broken down into raw materials which can go into making new products. If we are in government, we can use policy to provide the enabling conditions for the restructuring of our society's choice environment towards circularity. 
If we are in businesses, we can make circular products and provide recycling infrastructure to keep these materials in circulation. And we can bring thrown away products back into the circulation of materials. As individuals, we can encourage our stewards in government and industry to fulfill our shared desire to be predisposed towards circularity. But primarily, we can act in accordance with this desire by choosing more circular products and ensuring we don't throw anything away where the infrastructure to recycle is available. Then we'll be living in harmony with nature, remembering that we and everything we make and use are a part of its circular economy. In the end, we are all denizens of Earth, and in order to thrive, we must continue to learn how to live more symbiotically with each other and our environment.